I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. You can leave it on. <laughs> but there more passes for a, an easier course that they know they won't get work, yeah. right? So they have to come back for a level three. And, and it's that point, I'm like, they're trying to make the perfect course for the perfect candidate working in the perfect job. None of them exist. No. So I'm like, who's employing these people? Because we're not making enough money no. because there's too many shops. We've got shops that are locked into kind of a lack of ambition because you're terrified of hitting 90,000. Yeah. Um, and then having to VAT register. So, you know, and you know at, at 91,000 pounds, you're immediately 17 grand a year worse off. Yeah. So, you know, you can understand that, but it does breed a lack of ambition. I hear all this other warm and gooey stuff they say about opening a shop. The thing I didn't do was what I'm learning now after 15 years is the maths. Yeah. Do the maths after 90 grand and you'll realise how fucking hard it is. Mm. Hi, welcome to the Noble Barber podcast. I'm Anthony LeBan and we'll be talking to various people in the industry who've made it and their journey and how they got here. Talking honest, cutting through the crap and making sure your story and their story is heard to help your business and hopefully mine. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and I hope you enjoy this, this episode. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of the Noble Barber podcast. I'm Anthony LeBan. Um, I'm here today with uh, Luke Dolan. That's me. Hey, mate. How good you doing? To meet you. Thank you very much for coming in. How you doing? I'm very good. I'm very Excellent. good. We met at Barber Connect when we took this up there for, uh, for, the, for the weekend and we had a very brief chat. Uh, and I spoke to you for probably about five or six minutes and, and coming away from it, I was like, I've got to make sure I get you on. So thanks so much for coming in. That's all right, no problem. Um, we've already started nattering this morning and, yeah. uh, and got a lot, a lot covered. <laughs> Where do you want uh, to start? Maybe we should start filming some. Um, <laughs> but um, maybe bring us up to date, you know, what was your, what was your entrance into barbering and maybe up to, up to your very first shop I've, opening? I've done so much, so I'll do it really quickly. And I've said this story many, mm. many times. I started cutting hair in 96. Um, 96, 97, uh, my dad said I couldn't leave home until I got a job. <laughs> and I couldn't leave college until I got a job. So I literally went out the next day, walked through Harrow Town Centre and I saw a, an apprentice sign on a hairdresser's. So I went in, I had purple hair, I looked in absolute state and the bloke gave me a job. Excellent. Um, and I, 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 I'd say I kind of enjoyed it. I'm not going to say I was suddenly like this natural born, like gifted hairdresser I just I suppose I enjoyed it and then later on we me and my partner ended up um she got pregnant and then I sort of left so then I, I fell away from hairdressing I didn't do anything I was an estate agent I did sales blah 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 and then eventually ended up in quite a good job as a head of customer services for a sister company to Nintendo and then that was awful Right. Like one of the worst jobs I've ever You're not had. Not a corporate man after no, all. No, I enjoyed corporate world to a point because I was in it for a while, like a decade. Oh, right. Um, and it was good, but it was so stressful. Mm. And working it, it was a different kind of culture. It was very toxic. I got really, I wasn't very well as well at that point. Um, and then I, I just happened to be, I used to take my kids to the barbers there, uh, my two young boys. And uh, he knew I used to be a hairdresser. So I went in one day, he was a single man in the shop, and he, because one of his barbers had left, incidentally, that barber's now working at my shop. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> like like well, six well. degrees of separation. But, um, and uh, I was sat there, and he sort of looked at me, and he jokingly said, um, why don't you pick up a pair of scissors and give me a hand? And I, I kind of, like, I shit myself, really. And, I was and like, you hadn't oh, cut hair for a I'd decade? I kind of, like, I'd done my boys briefly, but with a pair of scissors. But I was a hairdresser. Mm. Um, and then I kind of I thought about it and I thought I wonder uh, could I do it so I went back and saw him later on in the eve like that evening and I said um, put my head around the door I said are you serious he said yeah he says you look like you, you've got like a friendly face you could do it and that's you know I said okay so I started working and did my job the stressful horrible job Monday to Friday and I went and did this on Saturdays um those yeah. first haircuts, like that first day, I absolutely shit myself. Oh, I was man. just, and because um, I didn't have the skill set, mm. um, I was rubbish, awful. And uh, they let me butcher their hair, but I had a great time, an absolute blast. So I then, that was around about November. So I did that through Christmas and then bit the bullet and I left Jump. my job. Um, the company was dying anyway. Mm. So, so I, I got out. <clears throat> And um, and then started cutting hair, yeah. 
And then four years later, I opened my shop in South Oxy. Wow. And that was that. So big learning curve from, um, for opening your, new sh- your first shop? Um, yes, or it was. Or did that feel like I, kind well, of natural I, territory? I'd been an estate agent. I'd worked in customer services. Like that was my main, in corporate mm. land. I, I'd done the sales thing, but the sales thing I kind of, I'd gone on to management pretty quickly. Um, so I got out of the negotiator role. I was in a sales manager, the marketing manager, then ended up in customer services, uh, which, it, and the estate agency introduced me to lots of solicitors. So actually opening a shop, like I, the, how I got the deal was through a solicitor who I knew from the estate mm-hmm. agency. Um, so that came my way because of that. Perfect. And then I, like, I knew the conveyancing route, so what, that wasn't scary or daunting. Um, and then running a shop, but like the whole customer service, the whole front end of marketing thing, was my bag, yeah, and it sort of it kind of all fell into place. But so you running, were well equipped for it. I well, you thought you were. I, I thought I was on paper. Like, yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I was. I likened by the end. I know I'm skipping forward a few Go years. On. At one point, I had when I had the like few shops, but mainly Watford and Ryslip. It was. I, I I tell people it was like a, a swan with a broken foot. Like you know, because they always say, you, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. I was just going around in circles, yeah. like back end. It looked great. We had the following on social media. I was doing the stuff all over the, you know, uppercut ambassador. I was flying all over the world. It was amazing. But back end, it was it was woeful. It was awful. So you had that. So you had those two stores for yep. a few years. Um, yeah, I was I was in Oxy for probably close to a decade. Oh, God. Um, and Rysip High Street, I'm still on Rysip High Street, but I've moved down the road from the first shop. So I've been there, let's say, 11, oh, yeah, 11, 12 years now, roughly. Um, I did have another shop in Stanmore, which is sort of like a nice little triangle. That was a project where I sort of took over the barber area. Right. And it was had a spa upstairs. Um, but that didn't work because we had... Uh, we had too many. We had a board of directors. Yeah, that's gonna for one shot. It was just it wasn't, it wasn't enough money. No one, no, it was destined yeah. to fail. And so when was the, this? Is this is mid two thousand and seventeen, wow. eighteen potentially? So, so you had the three, the three, and then when I spoke to you at Barber Connect, we managed to get to Moscow quite quickly in a six minute <laughs> yeah. conversation. Well, like, <laughs> so I, how did that come about? Well. I worked with Uppercut, like well, not oh. worked with it. They they made me ambassador, um, but coming close to uh, it's ten years almost to the day. I think maybe maybe the turn of this year, going into 2000, 2025, is about ten years, and they've been fantastic. Um, and you guys have stuck together all all through this, all through this, mm. yeah. Like we've you know. It's funny, if you watch their social media now, they're doing loads of things in Singapore and Asia, and it's like it's like watching what we were doing yeah. like eight or nine years ago. It's that kind of, um, they're doing all the hangouts and bits and mm. pieces. It's really doing well for them, but yeah, they, uh, they've stuck by me the whole time. And, and you ended up, so you were doing some show work or some education with them in Moscow? Well, they, they were just trying to open more European countries, you know, right. as a, yeah. as a, as a new territory, the yeah. new territories, and Europe was the expanding market. Um, so they were just, you know, as upper cut, we were growing in stature, cut, but these countries were contacting them saying, you know, uh, we want to stock you, um, we need some education, we need this, and blah, blah, blah. So that's where the ambassadors come in because we get sent over to these countries, cool. we we uh, educate their their team, and then it goes from there. So how do you go from kind of a bit of education in Moscow to Luke's Barbershop? Well, Moscow. It, it's not. It, it's like it's. Oh know, come on, man! That's a no, story. It's, it is a story, <laughs> but it's like it's like you know a magic trick. You know when someone tells you what the actual magic trick yeah. is, it doesn't actually seem that you know. Think oh, it's a bit boring. Actually. <laughs> oh, but yeah. it, it was the tiger pure, was in a cupboard <laughs> underneath yeah, the stage. Like, <laughs> so it seems a little bit mysterious. Yeah, it seems a bit mysterious. I got a shop in Russia. It was like um, I'd been out there in 2014, no, 2015, I think, and then. Um, that was with one company, and then the distribution changed. Um, so the uppercut guy, the first guy, that they went on something else. So, and it was just as there was a bit of a change in the the HQ here, and the European, like the European team, uppercut European team. So I was this. There's another Russia trip came out to meet a new distributor. So I went on my own, and um, 
And this, I just went over there and I got on really well with the guy. So he used to take me out there a lot to do education. And I went to all sorts of weird places. And we went for, for a good 18 months. He helped me get a business visa out there and stuff so I could go there a few years for, you know, lots of times. And it was... Proper it was Russian a, fixer. Proper Russian fixer. <laughs> he, he was ex -K, he's ex-KGB. Oh, mate. Honestly, honestly. <laughs> Um, honestly, like that, the, 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 uh, the, the Russian thing, like, it, that's probably for a pint over at like, one point. <laughs> the there's some, there's some stuff that went on. <laughs> anyway, um, it was great. Um, but he, he had other businesses. His wife had a really wonderful salon that did aesthetics and stuff like that. And she was a fantastic hairdresser. And he had lots of units around. He was, you know, he did sell American crew over there and he'd made a lot of money that way. So he had property. In, in Moscow, and he had a salon in this place called Shablovska. I probably just murdered that for the Russians, but yeah, Shablovska, um, which was about three stops away from Red Square. So it was like a, wow. it was like in a real economic area as well. Like they had like universities and stuff there. Um, really, real eclectic bunch of people. And he had this salon that wasn't doing very well. We said, why don't we turn it into a Luke's? And I said, oh. <laughs> like why? What? What does You're that say? No, are no, you? I didn't say that. Did I make a? I didn't make a euro. I didn't. I, honestly, I didn't make a, a penny. Oh, it's worth it for the story. I just. Mate. It was. You know, I, if you knew my backstory as a kid, and and some of the sort of difficulties I went through, sort of like late teens, early twenties, to I'm, I'm not going to go into it really, but. To have, like to have this opportunity, to have this opportunity, I was never going to say no. No, but I think actually thinking about it as, a, as an arc is that I only thought about getting it open. That was mm -hmm. my, like, if you want to talk manifestation and all that kind of stuff, I only ever saw the shop open. It was never a, like, longevity. No. I didn't really know how this was going to work. Um, it was just like, let's get it open. Yeah. So we got it open. We, we did staff it. Um, did it do well? I, I, I don't think so. It did all right. It was it was sometimes busy. I used to go out there and on my column would get booked up, but I was, you know, it was my name was above the mm. door. We had some really weird, like just very weird customers used to come. Not weird, but you know, we'd have attaches to ambassadors and helicopter pilots. Yeah, we're definitely and, having a pint, aren't we, Luke? <laughs> <laughs> uh, helicopter so pilots. So this was twenty eighteen? This got open in, uh, I'm going to say 2018. So this is pre-pandemic. And then, yeah, the pandemic closed all my shops, mm. um, effectively. Well, they, it closed everybody's shops. Yeah, it's not no. just like, oh, poor me. It was like the whole industry. It's the thing I never thought that and could there was happen. Just not, and that was it. You couldn't, no comeback. All the shops were closed and gone. Um, it was just trying was to keep them open. It, it just happened to be that the, the shop in Oxy, that the, the lease was coming to an end. He was looking to put that up, and mm. I, I was a, you know, there's a lot of things that were going on with that shop at the time anyway, behind closed doors, and I thought I just, I just it was just had enough. Mm. And at one point, you, you know, you have to think it's just bricks and mortar, mm. you know, your, your your sanity and what you're doing is is, is worth an awful lot mm. more. Um, so yeah, we moved on uh, from that, but yeah, COVID was 2019 was an incredible year, and it's. The tough thing coming back, especially for me at my age, because I was doing all these things in Europe, and I, you know, I've been, I've travelled to, done education over 30, 38 different countries or something yeah, ridiculous wow. for just putting hair on the floor. It's incredible, very, very blessed career. But then all of that came to a stop. Sorry, and then when everything came back after COVID, the phone had stopped ringing. Yeah, I used to do. I had a contract with a PR company that used to do all the activations for Foot Locker, Adidas, Nike. I used to work with Boots. I used to work with um, some other brands that just escape me right now. Yeah. But we had these wonderful contracts. The deafening silence of all, the door not yeah, being, the it's, bell not ringing. It just stopped. Yeah, and I, uh, it's not like, oh, once again, poor me. No, it's no, just, it, I mean, it, it is, I mean, it, it's brutal. Um, I mean, I shut my business. I had my business, which I closed down in, uh, I closed that down in 2000 and, Oh, what was it? 2011. Right. Uh, bank, all the bank crash, everything else. And my yeah, lease yeah, yeah. was done. And I'm like, time, you yeah. know what? But it really, it does hurt. I mean, I must admit, I think there was a point quite soon after it was all closed, done, dusted, that I suddenly kind of went, oh, fuck that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, and, I, and I got that opportunity in 2012 to then go, right, I'm going to rewrite myself. Mm. 
Is that what is that is that kind of what happened with you, or was it were you just relieved, or did was it more painful than that? Um, what the clothes in the shops? No, I don't. I the, I knew I'd, I, I'm overly ambitious, so I, I I knew that I'd be able to make it, mm. and I could sort of deflect into something else. Um, I suppose it was just my it was my ego having to deal with it. I think mm. it was like me thinking of I got to this point where because. But it is ego. I mean, you know, it is, you, no, need, it is you, ego. you need that ego to want to put you through, put yeah. yourself through doing a shop, doing some shows, doing all these things that give, yeah. give everyone and anyone anxiety and stress. But yeah. you want to do them because you want to show that yeah. that you can. Yeah. Uh, and uh, like and taking got, it away or getting it gone is brutal. It is brutal. And it, you, have to, you have to take a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror and mm. just realise like who you are. Because you sort of become this version of yourself, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, for social media or when you're standing up on stages mm. and stuff like that, you morph into this person, mm. and you're like, "Am I actually that person?" Um, and my ego, it, it took a it took a massive knock, but you know, I'm glad it happened because I'm a better person for yeah. it. Oh no, I'm I'm exactly the same. I'm, you know, I, I, I didn't enjoy 2011 in any way, shape, or form, and I don't think I really enjoyed 2009, no. 2010. But I, I do but, think I think what I, a good message to put out there though is that um, everything comes at a cost, mm. and you know, I'm very blessed and I'm lucky to have had stood on the stages I've stood on the stages of and with, you know. And there's some guys at the very top that people look at now, and I'm very lucky to say they're my friends. And we've all had, like, it came at a cost. We lost relationships. A lot of the people I know at the very top have lost, like, they're, they're now divorced or their partners or, or whatever. Like oh, The demands the, on you. Uh, it is. Yeah. It, you, you sort of separate yourself. And flying all around the world sounds great, but when you're not seeing your loved ones, mm. it, it does come at a cost. Good stuff comes at a cost as well as bad yeah. stuff. yeah. No, I think that's it. I mean, I think definitely it's hard, like you say, from the ego and for anyone who's, you know, who's lost their business or in the process of shutting their business and all that kind of stuff. I think it's important to kind of be kind to yourself and give yourself a, a bit of a break that this is just another experience. It's just another yeah. learn. It's just bricks and, and it's mortar. just the next thing. Yeah. 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 And, you're, and it's all survivable and, oh, it is. And, 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 and more. And for me, it was, I realised that the mar your market value is still your market value. Mm. You, the fact that you're standing in a certain shop or in a certain area has no bearing. Mm. You know, if you're good and you, you love what you do, you can stand anywhere. Yeah. And your market value is still your market value. Yeah. People are still going to find you. So that's, you know, I, I'd never seen it that way. So yeah. that, that was a, well, that I think was a that's good it. thing it does to learn. That, that level of kind of angst does give you kind of very clear glass to look through, I think. Yes, yeah, yes. when you, when there's nowhere else to look, <laughs> there's nowhere else to look. <laughs> well, yeah, there's no excuses, yeah. no noise to deflect you when you are actually there and your business have gone. Yeah, and you are just back as you. <laughs> I, you know, I think it does you the world. Of good. It did me the world of good. Well, it taught me accountability, yeah. and it, that's so important in life. Mm. Anyway, you know, you've got to be able to take yeah. it. And sometimes the brutal truth, it, regardless of what happens, if your name is above the door, your name's on the lease. It's your fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, so, you know, we're now post-COVID. So this, this, this new born world of yours post, is all post-COVID. So we're, yeah. what's your, what would you say? New Luke's, three, <laughs> Luke 2.0 <laughs> or 3.0 or what are we on? Um, um, well, is from got, 23 and a half years, three years old? It's three years old now. So we're coming closer to an offering. And half, Moscow three. went as well un untethered. That'll, there was no... <laughs> no, that was, um, in the end, it was... There was we, no spiked we umbrella gonna, on a bridge <laughs> anywhere. No, no, <laughs> no, you had to be careful going to Costa. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we had to, you know, it was it was amicable. It was like, we're never going to get any money from Putin. Yeah. Um, there was no, And we made the decision right at the very beginning. Yeah, cool. Um, and he was like, you know, my partner out there, um, he was like, look, oh, I'm just going to do... Because he had a like um, a wholesale shop beside it that so he was swallow able to just kind of swallow yeah. that in because that was doing all right. So um, you've done... So you're out the other side of COVID. Yep. You've, you've, you've done all of this. You've had the T-shirt. You've, you've bought a badge. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, you know, I climbed back on and set up another company in 2014... Um, so I had three years of licking wounds and catching me breath and making a plan. 
You sound like you bounce I've much had, quicker. <laughs> I haven't had that. Well, my, my son now works with me, and he's now he trained t- during COVID to be a barber, um, and he's now you know the manager of the shop. And it's it's not just me; it's the pair of us together, oh, like lovely. forging um, a future together. Um, and this is this is close to where your original. Yeah, we're about like fifty yards down the road. Oh, cool. Um, in probably what is a better space, even though it's smaller, the rent's a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, but even though that's, but you know, I think it's about to go up. But hey ho. Um, so yeah, that's that was okay. Um, it was, it's doing really well. Um, Reese is doing well. He's he's the manager there, and I've got a, like a great great team. But I wanted to do something a bit more. Um, like I've done a lot of education, and like I, you probably realised, I've done a. Like most of the doors in the arena of Barbara, yeah. I've managed to walk through. But I thought I wanted to have something a bit more profound to walk into, or to, to look, try and make some changes in the time horizon left to me. Which is, you know, if I retire and at sixty-five, I've got twenty years of trying to impact somewhere mm-hmm. and do something. So the thing I didn't really know anything about was state education. I've done private education. I've run a, like got the academy set up and stuff. Yeah. But I started doing lecturing at West Hearts, West Hearts College to do um, to looking after the under seventeens and well, the, the seventeen year olds and stuff, just to get an understanding of things because well, there's so many how's issues. How's that for a learning curve? Oh my god, um, where do I even begin? There's so many different podcasts for this. I think. Um, <laughs> for, but, so you're having to follow the national criteria yeah. for the NVQ or the VTEC, or whatever. and it's. Uh, I don't really want to, you know, I don't want to put but, people no, off no, no, from doing it. No, 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 was that a struggle? It. Yeah, because it's it doesn't... <laughs> um, the actual course itself, because we, a lot of us within industry look at state education and go, it's not good enough, mm. which it probably isn't. Mm. But then when you actually go and put yourself in that yeah, space, no. you're like, you're, they're doing the best they can mm. with what they can. Because, you know, you, you don't get... Um, a bunch of middle class kids that want to go and do barbering, right? And then also these kids have got in there like, have they got GCSEs? Probably not. Um, what kind of backgrounds have they got? What is their context? It's just, and then you know the fact that they've actually picked a course. You know, some of them have got like undiagnosed issues or yeah. the, dyslexia and ADHD and all this other stuff, and you you got to try and teach them. You know, there's there's a lot more parameters and context that we don't mm. seem to realise as an industry. We just we just palm it off as like it's just not good enough. Mm. We're like, well, this is why I went there to go. Well, what can be done? And then you also look in within the. It's so heavily regulated, but we're a completely unregulated industry. Yeah. And you're like, it doesn't doesn't balance. I mean, I can, I mean, I've I've had exactly that from both sides. The college is saying, you know, we want. You know, we'd love these names, we'd love these barbers, we'd love these people to come like you are, get involved. Um, but it's not, it's not that straightforward. No, it's not that straightforward. And they, they you know, I, I, any barbers out there that want to get involved and actually, you know, spend a bit of time, it's, you probably need a couple of days a week. There's probably openings. You could probably just go and help um, and see what it's like. Mm. Um, and I think if you bolster or go along and sort of like help kind of bring it together as a, an actual barbering college. Because a lot of these things you go to, they're, they're, they're set up for hairdressing, yeah. right? So barbering is just kind of a bolt-on. And a lot of these bar, like kids that have gone into barbering feel like this is all they've got left. Mm. But then they go into, a, uh, into a, an, an environment where they just feel like there's nothing really for them. Because it's just hairdressing or beauty. Yeah. You know, there's, not, there's no barber's chairs, they're still sharing clippers, you know, there's mm, there's yeah. so many things yeah. that you they don't have. Um, so if you can go there and help actually make it better over a time horizon of a few years, you might actually make people that want people will want to go there, yeah. which then makes the people coming out the other. <coughs> it's like an intake of any school. Yeah, yeah. You get kids that want to go there; they come out the other end, you know, like ready for yeah. the world. Um, and this is what you've got to try and do. Yeah. So you give two days a week. Um, I yeah two well two days a week and I now uh, I think from September I'll be teaching the evening class as well. Mm-hmm. It's quite a bit of time, but it's it's like it's I'm learning I'm, I'm learning a lot myself at mm. the same time, especially educationally. Um, it, it, it is tough though because you just want to help everybody. Yeah, and and some people you just you 
just can't. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, like I so, said, I mean, I think I've, I've loved training. My whole career has been, has had a kind of training backbone from, you know, from the minute I qualified. Mm. Um, I've never done the state route. I did, you know, we have a, a demanding, a patient, de- patience demanding uh, local college yeah. um, that is failing for many reasons and management, I think, has got to be at the, the heart of that one. Yeah. Um, but it is a problem that we've, you know, that, that keeps coming up about getting these guys qualified, getting them enthusiastic and going to, on a course where, you know, the, the arse is hanging out the trousers in, 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 yeah. in, the, in the actual criteria is, is, is going to lose them, isn't it? But the, the difficulty is, is that, you know, I, I'm, I've got two minds. It's one, I want to help everybody, mm. but two, from an industry point of view, we want it to be more difficult. Yeah. We need to say no. Yeah. Um, and it's there's the this like a juxtaposition be, the, 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 between the, the two. The bar's got to be at, yeah. It's trying to find and, the Goldilocks point for the bar to be set, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I, I was I'm I, I'm on the um, the board uh, with well I sit on a panel um, for the sitting guilds as like a employer advisor. validation as an advisor, and um, you know that I can almost see they're incrementally trying to make it a little bit easier, mm. and I'm like. But we've got more so, funding, like oversaturation more. is the thing yeah. that will kill us. More passes, more money. Well, more yes. Yeah, that's well, it. no, but more passes. But they, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. You can say what you like. <laughs> but that more passes for a, an easier course that they know they won't be um, eligible. They won't get work, yeah. right? So they have to come back for a level three. You see, uh, and and it's that point. I'm like, wow, yeah. like so it, it's. They're trying to make the perfect course for the perfect candidate working in the perfect job. And neither, none of them exist. No. None of them do. So I'm like, who's employing these people? Because we're not making enough money no. because there's too many shops. Yeah. Well, this, it comes back to, I mean, you know, I mean, on the whole, everyone says that the best, you know, the best barbers come through the apprenticeship scheme. Um, yeah, I would, and, I would say and, that. And But no one's got but, the money but, to do an apprenticeship. I mean, you get nothing for it. I mean, you know, I mean... We do have some apprentices, but it's really hard. It's really hard. And, you know, my apprentices are amazing. Most of them are still in the company. I think they're incredible. Um, but it's harder and harder every year to, to stick with it. And you get no funding, no support, higher regular. It's, it's, it's re- I can understand why fewer and fewer people do it. But if you then back that up alongside a college that's bringing out kids that aren't really getting the quality of training there, they're not getting trained in the shops. They're not getting trained in college. Yeah, what, that's you can you can write it. You know, you can write it on the back of a postage stamp why the industry's struggling. Yeah, and yeah. it's we're in uncharted territory. Really, mm. we're in this the place that I don't actually know what will happen. Mm. Um, I think that uh, I think rent a chair will devour the industry because people we're at a point where it, like inequality is exploding. And the you know inflation and what have yeah. you. So now you're needing to be on a certain amount of money, which shops cannot afford to pay in the old scheme. Well, and I think that all comes into it, isn't it? You know, we've got we've got shops that are locked into kind of a lack of ambition because you're terrified of hitting ninety thousand. Yeah, um, and then having to VAT register. So you know, and you know, at, at ninety one thousand pounds, you're immediately seventeen grand a year worse off. Yeah. Um, so you know you can understand that, but it does breed a lack of ambition. Yeah, it does um, massively. And, and, and with a lack of ambition, it also means a lack of income. You know, if you've got a company that, that's capped at ninety, whichever way you're doing it, right? I'm not even getting into that. But you're capped at ninety. You can't spend money inside the company that doesn't no. add up to ninety. So if you've got to bring on an apprenticeship, you've got to pay their salary. Yeah. You've got to fund their training. You've got to have other staff that will help train them. Yeah. It's impossible to do. So it's only companies that are VAT registered yeah. or doing over 90, mm-hmm. and there's fewer and fewer of them. With chair rental, it's even less so. And the bugbear with chair rental, which I've got no issue with, is it's great if you've got customers. If you've got no customers, you're screwed. Yeah. You know, 50%, 60, 40, 30, 70, whichever way you slice it, 50% of fuck all is, 50, is fuck all. <laughs> <It's> fuck all. <laughs> but and bit. that's what you've got. And you've got these young kids who've got no clients standing in a shop wanting to earn five, six hundred pounds a week, not recognising that they've got to make, they've got but to be turning over. Five, six hundred, they want more, mm. right? They want more because 
the information that like the it, the information era that we're in through we can call it social media or the internet or whatever you yeah. call it but it's just we there's too much information like i've i've heard it from 17 year olds mouths right i just had a, a group that finished in whatever uh, august or july and i asked them what's next right what where are you going and some of them are obviously going nowhere yeah. but some are, have got jobs their thing is i'm going to go and find a commission shop and I'm going to get as many customers as possible. I'm going to work as hard as possible. You're like, fair play. Right. And then I'm going to walk them down to a rent-a-chair shop, and I'm going to take all the money myself. Mm. This is what their plan mm. is. So then what's the point of having a shop? Yeah. And, this is, this is the, and that's the information mm. that, like, dare I say it, like some barbers that are so desperate for clout on internet, on, on social media, and they'll put it out there saying, oh, earn 10 grand a month, earn, earn $15,000 a month. It's like following this US model. Rent a chair works in America because their shops are five times bigger. Yep. And also the taxation system's different it's, state it's so to state. Different. You can almost pinch which, which state is doing, you know, where the booth rental is on state. Because yeah. the better the tax breaks in the state, you see more tax. You know, yeah. here we get no tax breaks. No, um, and you know, and and they're still wanting. You still got to pay your tax. You still got to pay tax. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to. And if you're making, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, this sums off the top of my head. But if you are managing to do ten grand a month, that's one hundred and twenty. You know, you're you then know, that's you're we then, know that's twenty four grand a year VAT. Twenty four grand VAT and another another twenty six well, in tax. I think. The, pit, the, math, the maths is, you know, I hear all this other warm and gooey stuff they say about opening a shop. The thing I didn't do was what I'm learning now after 15 years is the maths. Yeah. Do the maths after 90 grand and you'll realise how fucking hard it is, mm. right? Like I, I, I built a subscription service into my business, right? That was, it's so successful that I can't afford it. Yeah. Because now with VAT and it's fully digital, I can't afford it. No. Unless I ruin all the value by adding 20% on, our lives stay exactly the same. It's more expensive for the customer, yeah. but I can't afford it. Yeah. But that's what I mean. It hits exactly that in the fact that it, it, it just breeds this, it, it breeds it on ambition. You just don't be ambitious about it. Well, and Labour, this new Labour government are already telling us how rubbish it is, mm. are already saying that they might drop it to 45 grand. Mm. But then every rent a chair shop is under 45. Mm. So this is this is we're on yeah. I don't know what happens no, next. I mean, I think that's it. I think, well, I think every area of our industry is kind of is veering towards a cliff. It's just none of us can quite see well, what's. I would we like. We can't see how far the drop is on the other side. I would like, yeah, no. I would like some of the say the magazines and stuff like that, and some of the bigger companies out there. You know, some of the big clipper companies that are making the money that just to help us because mm. that what they're doing is is that they're promoting put your prices up. They think they're helping, but you're pushing us further and further into this, this bracket under 90, right? Where people don't know what to do thereafter yeah, yeah. and all this fear. Help us do a movement of the VAT. Help us do this. Yeah. Because that's where we get the, if we were all making that little bit of a margin, 20% is the margin mm. that would actually help and bring more apprentices and have yeah, more money. Change the ma it changed the model completely. And it, it would. You know, but... But it's, oh, that's a, it's, you know, it's a hard wall to clear through. They're not, they're not yeah. going to do it. No. They, they'd be better off saying, coming out in the press tomorrow and saying all haircuts are available. Yeah. That would, that, would, that, would, you know, that would be exactly the same thing, really. They, they, and then every company would have to be of AT yeah. and all the prices would go up. Yeah. And then, and then it we, is what it is. It's, yeah, all yeah, the prices. Yeah. Because the, the uneven playing field is that you're rewarded for going over 90 by charging 20%, but no one else is. Yeah. And that's, that's oh, no, 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 I, I got you. you know. So you've gone through all of this. You've yes. happened it. You've done it. And now, what are you up to at the moment? Explain what you're. <laughs> what you're um, what, I, I slipped a hackney. Um, <laughs> uh, Nomad or Miguel. Yeah. Um, he is. He's such a bright and intelligent and creative guy that it's done so well. Um, but he's almost a little like if you see some of his stories on his. Um, on his social media that he's almost crippled with like some of his ADHD. He's just got the, the, um, the diagnosis through and, and all this other stuff and he sort of really struggles with some stuff. And the fact that he's got a shop in India, a shop in Berlin, a shop in London, mm. he has a grooming range, he has 700,000 subscribers on YouTube. Like, you know, and I've known him a long time. We've spoken for over a decade about all kinds of issues yeah. and we've helped each other along the way. And then he approached, there was a couple of us that he had in mind to help him with Hackney because he just needed to just, 
because he couldn't get there. And the mm. team that uh, were working in Hadney, he'd never this new team, he'd never worked with them. And he was like, I can't. I'm in Liverpool. I'm doing this. Mm. I want to do a documentary and all this sort of stuff. So he approached me and he said, "Would you, would you become my partner and, and help me out with the shop?" And I was like, "Yeah, okay. You know, let's let's see what we can do." Um, because I really, I totally understand what he's doing. You know that that brand and he's the whole travel thing, and he wants yeah. to think the shops to be like going on holiday. That you know that going oh, into nice. a different country. It's really beautiful, mm. and he's into the ritual of the beards and stuff like that. So I, I, you know, I'm in. I really get it. So that's why we're kind of working. Are you together. enjoying that? How long's that been going on? Only like a couple of months now. Enjoying it? I am enjoying it. It's it's another demand. It's a different thing. Yeah. It's um. It I. It's, it's sort of takes some of your attention away. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes, and that's, you know, I do tell people that sometimes you've got to, don't worry about passive stuff. You need to sort of like drill down on what you're actually doing. Um, but I think this, this project has got, could be a really fun one over yeah, time. Yeah. So it, it's just managing the, the time right with it, really. Beautiful. Yeah, I keep trying to get Miguel and he's not keen to come on it. He's, <laughs> he's just, uh, I think he just gets a little bit, Oh no! I just—I mean, I just love everything he does. I just think—I think the journey is just fascinating, mate. I am so glad that we bumped into each other and had <laughs> three-minute conversation about Moscow at Father Connect. It's yeah. been an absolute joy meeting you. I'm so pleased we did it. Okay, and um, it's been great. Thank mate, you so much. Do, I'm sure, but I'm, well, I think we'll, I'm going to do another. I think I'm going to drill down more on the whole state college. I might get a few of us together. Um, I've had a couple of conversations and you would be a good one. We'll maybe try and get you back to have a bit more of a focus point on that, maybe. Yeah, I do. Your game. I think if part of your thing is cutting through the, the crap, right? Yeah. And I think... I think, I think, we should I think some difficult... Convers- some difficult... Like that? Some difficult conversations are worth having. Yeah. Because that's where you, you know... That's where, that's where the magic is. Yeah. Really. That's where the growth is. Oh, so I think that's a good one. Let's make sure that goes in. I like that. Luke? Mate, good luck with... Well, you don't need luck, mate. You've got more resilience than the rest of us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Noble Barber Podcast. We're always looking for interesting people and interesting stories. If you know someone or you are someone with a great story that you want to share, get in touch and come and join me on the sofa. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the episode and we'll see you next time.